talking about the experience of concert going and how it's changed across the centuries. As we slowly see COVID-19 restrictions lifted, some of us might be starting to think about attending a concert in person. And of course, there'll still be plenty of online concerts available as well. For most musicians, a concert or a gig is at the centre of our activities. Most of our energies are directed towards a concert with an audience, whether in person or online. We plan for it, design a programme, often rehearse for it for months, all in order that we might play to our best on a particular occasion at a particular time. Most people are kind of familiar with the idea of a formal concert as the central event of musical life for both performers and for audiences. Somebody plays and we all listen. But of course it wasn't always like this. Uh, when did formal concerts, as we know them, actually start to happen? I've often talked about concerts in the 18th century, but what was the case before then? Well, before formal concerts started, musical performances tended to be um, sort of centred around a particular function. Um, so, for example, uh, you would have music for dancing, music for feasting, uh, music for worship of God. Um, and so it would generally accompany um, some sort of activity rather than being performed for its own sake. Um, there would have been private concerts, of course, um, as we might sort of think of them in the royal courts across Europe, but these were certainly not public events, and they certainly weren't ticketed um, or, or anything that you could attend if you wanted to. But in the last few decades of the 17th century, the music scene in Britain changed. Most formal music making would have taken place at court or in church, but then Charles II having uh, visited Versailles and seen the amazing artistic empire there of Louis XIV, wanted to set up um, a similarly excellent musical court in England. And he even set up a rival band of violins to uh, Louis' quatre vingt uh, violin du roi. Um, and of course, a lot of these musicians were brought over from France and other musicians started to flock to London in the last part of the 17th century from France and also from Italy. Um, for example, star violinists like Nicola Matthias, um, who arrived um, in the 1660s, 1670s. Um, he dazzled London with his virtuosity. Composers such as Henry Purcell actually started to compose chamber music in the Italian style um, and this became very fashionable uh, to hear this new music and to explore it for its own sake. In 1690, the French dictionary, Dictionnaire Universel, defined a concert as an assembly of musicians who sing and play instruments. So many of the first concerts are actually likely to be pretty informal in nature and come from a kind of tavern or pub musical culture, um, which uh, was sort of almost underground in the mid 17th century. We can think of it perhaps more as a bit of a jamming session, um, mainly consisting of professional musicians and some amateurs kind of mixed up, uh, a bit of fun. Um, and they would meet up to play um, of an evening, uh, perhaps as a kind of musical club, rather than an actual formal concert series. And for this kind of gathering, tickets wouldn't have been sold, the audience uh, definitely wouldn't have been quiet, um, it would have been quite different from the kind of concerts experience that we're used to. But it was actually the precursor for the kind of more formal concerts that we start to see in the 18th century. In fact, one of the very first concert series was run by John Bannister, one of Charles II's 24 violins. Unfortunately, his controversial behaviour um, and his uh, insult, apparently, of the king at some point um, meant that he was increasingly estranged from the court and sort of started doing his own musical projects. Um, he started having concerts, um, first in a pub, um, in the 1660s, uh, in the Mitre Tavern in Fleet Street, then he moved um, to the George and White Friars, then to Chandler Street, and eventually becoming more and more successful, he had larger venues um, in Lincoln's Inn's Fields, and also then in the Essex Rooms um, by 1678. And Roger North described the concerts as taking place first in an obscure room and in a public house. Um, but this actually, later on particularly, the concerts really were quite large scale um, and Bannister was able to have um, 
semi-dramatic performances uh, involving the most strange combinations of instruments um, that you can imagine. And uh, this is where we get the term the parley of instruments from. Um, apparently he used to play it on the flageolet himself um, as part of these consorts of musicians, uh, something which apparently had never been heard before nor since at the time. Um, so that's perhaps a, something to behold. Another notable concert series, incredibly long running and also much better known, is that run by the Coleman Thomas Britton in Clerkenwell. Uh, he must have been a relatively wealthy merchant, um, as he had a great enthusiasm for amassing printed music and also musical instruments. Upon his death, he had really quite a, a valuable collection. Um, through him, we can kind of see that it was quite easily to be s easy to be socially mobile if you were interested in music at this point. Um, in his concerts, uh, which were held above his uh, little sort of coal loft um, in Clerkenwell, he actually had not only just professional musicians attending, but also uh, the gentry, uh, as we'll hear in a minute, and he became something of a celebrity in London. And many people saw him as kind of the product of London's unique urban environment. We have some descriptions of Thomas Britton. In 1713, Sir Richard Steele in The Guardian wrote, We have a small Coleman, who from the beginning, with two plain notes which made up his daily cry, has made himself master of the whole compass of the gamut, and his frequently concerts of music at his own house for the entertainment of himself and his friends. However, it, doesn't, it wasn't just an informal gathering, and in fact, John Hawkins, Music Historians, gives a very detailed description of what it was like to attend these concerts. Uh, he describes where the, uh, the coal loft was, and, and then he says, On the ground floor was a repository, for, a repository for small coal. Over that was the concert room, which was a very long and narrow room, and had a ceiling so low uh, that you could barely stand up in it. The stairs to this room were on the outside of the house, and could scarce be ascended without crawling. The house itself was very old and low-built, and in every respect so mean as to be fit habitation for only a poor man. Notwithstanding all this, um, this mansion, despicable as it may seem, attracted to it a polite company as aud an audience as ever the opera did. And a lady of the first rank of this kingdom, the Duchess of Queensbury, one of the most celebrated beauties of her time, may yet remember that in the pleasure which she manifested at hearing Mr. Britton's concert, she seemed to have forgotten the difficulty with which she ascended the steps that led to it. Later on in the century, concert series became even more formal and much more exclusive. Uh, we can think of perhaps the Bach Arbel concert series, which ran from 1764, for which ticket prices were extremely high. This series was actually organised by, by a woman, Teresa Cornelis, and she actually held these concerts um, for exclusively noble audiences um, at her house in Soho Square. She made sure to engage all the best musicians and featured uh, brand new music from Germany, from Italy, and these concerts really came to rival the opera as a kind of source of uh, fashionable West End entertainment. There were also concerts outside London, um, on the outskirts, for example at Ruckelt House, and these sort of became all-day affairs. Um, so you would have breakfast, um, and followed by a concert in the mid-morning, um, with sort of extra food, specially laid on fish, uh, this kind of thing, and then dancing in the afternoon with a different um, band, uh, which must have gone on late into the afternoon, if not the evening. It sounds a great uh, occasion for everybody. Not all concerts, however, were part of a series. Um, there were other types of large concerts at which large-scale works were performed, for example Handel's Lenten Oratorio series, or the concerts of the Academy of Ancient Music, who had a kind of early music revival even in the 18th century. And then there was the interesting phenomenon of the benefit concert. This was often held in aid of a particular charitable cause, such as a hospital, or for a particular musician or pair of musicians. Maybe they needed a career boost, maybe they'd fallen on hard times for some reason. 
um, James Oswald actually had a benefit concert for him in March 1745, um, and I noticed when researching him that he actually had another child at that point, so I wonder whether that might have been related. Um, but of course, benefit concerts weren't just um, sort of to raise money, they could also raise your profile. And actually, they were often organised for star performers as part of their salary. So, for example, uh, star singers at the opera would be given a, a, an annual salary and then also one or two benefit concerts per year. Um, and if these were well organised and well attended, they could be incredibly lucrative. But yet, if you were to organise one um, and it was a flop, um, it could actually be the cause of your financial ruin because hiring the theatre or hiring the concert hall would be so expensive. And so, in just a century, informal musical evenings in East End taverns had gradually become a fashionable night out in the West End of London. Purpose-built concert rooms were built not only in London but also Edinburgh, Bath, Newcastle and several other cities as well. As travel became faster and easier, musicians uh, now often gave successive concerts in different places in what we would now recognise as a kind of concert tour. Essentially, public concerts, now aimed very much at an elite audience, had become a fundamental part of British musical life. So now, time for some music. Today we've actually recorded Paul's Steeple from John Walsh's Division Flute a very pop popular publication containing divisions on well-known grounds. It was pretty much copied from Playford's earlier publication, The Division Violin, which Thomas Britton actually had in his collection. Um, however, there are some changes because, of course, the violin has a greater range than the recorder, um, but it was definitely for the recorder. The flute was actually the way that the recorder was generally referred to in the late 17th century. Paul's Steeple is probably one of the oldest tunes in the collection, um, and it's also known as the Duke of Norfolk in some other publications. It probably refers to the old St Paul's, um, which burnt down in 1561, um, and apparently the tune was actually filed um, about sort of a week later after the fire. Um, it's very much the kind of thing which I can imagine would have been played and enjoyed um, in some of the more informal concerts um, in taverns and pubs in the late 17th century. <laughs>
So we've talked about concerts a few hundred years ago, but what about today? What's the future of concert going in Britain? Already during the pandemic, uh, we've actually seen the development of online concerts, and of course this has really changed the experience of concert going. It's rather easier to go to a concert, but uh, of course the feeling has rather changed. Uh, you can stop and start the concert whenever you wish. If you don't, don't enjoy a piece, you can skip it. If you don't want to listen to the spoken introductions, you don't have to. And of course, if you love a piece, then you can play it again and again to your heart's content. But of course, unless you have a virtual reality set or a seriously impressive home cinema set up, it's not going to really feel the same as actually going to a concert. It'll feel a little bit 2D. You might struggle to feel that you've actually been to a concert, because for many people, travelling to the concert, having your ticket checked, buying a drink in the interval, chatting to your neighbour, are all really important parts of the experience of going to a concert. But there are other ways in which concert going is changing. Many organisations, particularly in early music, are trying very hard to make the concert experience much more accessible, less elitist and more relaxing for those who might be trying a classical music concert for the very first time. I think this is brilliant and there are so many ways of, dif of doing it. Um, one of the best concerts we gave before the pandemic um, was at Brighton, music, Brighton Early Music Festival and instead of the audience being in a uh, Rose, uh, we had a kind of cafe style uh, with, us, with everybody at small tables and it was just such a lovely atmosphere. Um, at Litchfield Festival we actually performed in a restaurant and the, the, the setup was circular so we were in the middle and everyone was eating and then listening um, during our performance. Really a brilliant way of connecting with our audience um, and making everything a little bit more enjoyable and a little less formal. Um, I would definitely like to, for example, recreate those Ruckelt House concerts um, with the breakfast and the dancing, although I would definitely charge much less expensive ticket prices uh, than they did in the 18th century. Well, I guess that's all for today. We hope to see you either online or maybe in real life at some of our concerts this autumn. We're really hoping that these will all go ahead, um, especially our prize winners concert at the London International Festival of Early Music. Tickets are now on sale for the whole of the festival, so do head over and get yours now. Next time, I'll be on location in Edinburgh and I'll be exploring the area where the Edinburgh Musical Society held at concerts in the 18th century. See you then.